master plan Gonna make a geoid out of this flat land Scott A little ditty about a master plan Gonna make a geoid out of this flat land Scott All right, I think I resolved that, hopefully. Nope, sure didn't. Why is it doing this? Hold on. Hold on. Where is it echoing from? Why is it doing this? Hold on. Oh. I'm literally retarded. I had it open in the background. All right. We are live. Welcome to Ether Cosmology Roundtable number 38. Shane's going to do a presentation on Earth curvature and versus optical curvature. Shane, take it away. Actually, we're going to do Eratosthenes, right? We're going to do mostly Eratosthenes. We are going to go into optical curvature and math at the end for sure. But the thing that always gets cited with vagaries and misdirection and people who just, you know, heard a concept and they're saying that this proves something, but they really have no idea about any of it. So we're going to go through and replace the vagary with some alarming specificity. We're going to go through what the measurements were, how they were incorrectly applied, who applied them. And um, <laughs> see which one, which application of that measurement of the circumference makes more sense. Uh, let's see here. Our principal deriver. Oh, there he is. This, this man right here, who probably was definitely real and who only exists on Wikipedia. Anyway, this is an actual photo I found, right? In the archives. It uh, says the plaque reads, you know, the, the fuckwit who aggressively misapplied the concept of a circumference. Hmm. Ah, I don't know, it's a little abrasive. Let's, let's see. Like, essentially, wait a second. I gotta do push to talk for Discord. It's very annoying. All right, voice activity all around. So, what we're gonna start with is the basics, right? The parts of a circle. <laughs> the basic math for the parts of a circle. How a circumference applies to a circle. Primarily, chiefly, almost exclusively, until people try to apply it to sphericity, by applying it to an inner circle, right? So we have the circumference, which is just the total distance outside the edge. You have the radius distance from the center to the edge and the diameter, which would be from one edge to the other edge, right? Super easy. Here's the math that would support that. Again, this is how they derive 69 miles per degree based on our circumference, right? Say 24,000 miles times, you know, if that equals uh, 2 pi r, you got, you know, 2 times 3.14 times 39.59 to get that 24,901 miles that everyone's familiar with. Anyway, it works backwards, you know, for the circle in the Gleason's map to get 69 miles per degree. But these are the basic formulas, right? Area, circumference, diameter. Interestingly, the only difference between a circle and a sphere in terms of these variables is area. Area is the only thing that differs. They have the same radius, the same circumference, the same diameter. So if we move on to, say, let's look at applied most chiefly, right? Here's how people in history have applied. If you look at Google, here's how they're going to apply the circumference measurement and what he did. But essentially, it always equals the same thing. These two, right, are equal. We're going to go through that. But here's how we can apply it. Here's how it actually applies when you're going to do the math. Here's how we can mark the actual place over Alexandria, which he took the measurement and then take the circumference of the said shadow, and then give the shadow measurements of the sun to denote the sun's limit directly around Alexandria. We'll get to that right at the end here. And again, it will all make sense. <laughs> it will all make way more sense. So let's get to it. If you look it up, 
right? Here is from geodesy.noaa.gov, Eratosthenes, right? What he did. So he was at Alexandria. He used a known distance to another place that was 800 kilometers, all right, called Syene. And what he did was on equinox, took the measurement of a shadow over Alexandria where he was, and then he took the same measurement simultaneously through, I don't know, some magic longitude or wiretap method for his friend with instant communication and sign. But we're not going to go over that part. We're just going to go over how they took two measurements simultaneously. So that's exactly what you want to do to get a proper measurement and a limit. He did the difference between those two measurements of shadows, right? 7.2 degrees denoted that 1 50th of a circle. Thought they, oh, now I can divide by 360, getting the math at the bottom, which would be, you know, 360 degrees divided by 7.2 degrees times 800 kilometers. The distance between the two gives us the approximate circumference of 40,000 kilometers. Now, that isn't exactly what we have for today, but they always say it's close enough. And it is, of course, the origin of all sphericity. Uh, the only place where, oh, you know, we knew for thousands of years that Earth was, well, this is, this is it. This is all they had. This is all that there is. And this is completely misapplied, right? So here's how they would apply it, right? A dude over here taking a sun angle. Okay, well then, obviously, because of the sky and the sun, then the ground beneath our feet must be spherical. Wait, did you miss a step? Nope, nope, that's what they did. Conversely, though, if you were just like, hey, I live on a flat plane that I can see, denoted by a horizon, which is the, you know, optical differentiator <laughs> of my... Uh, elevation angle so I can start to take measurements, right, with the alt as coordinate system. You need a bisecting divider, great meridian, always the horizon. And in this case, if I take the horizon and I like, oh, look, if I make the same measurement from the sun and I, and I do the same thing over at Syene over here and I do the same computation, I could come up with, well, this is just the limit of the sun. I'm looking at the sun, right? I'm measuring the sun. My calculation should apply to the sun. That makes sense to everyone, I hope. Not to take a step off the deep end and go, Measurement of the sun, looking at the sun, going to apply that right to the ground beneath my feet. No, incorrect. That's retarded. Please, you know, let's, let's keep it consistent. So we're looking at the sun, we're measuring the sun, we're going to apply what we have to the limits of the sun. And if we look at it, the sun goes all the way to this way, all the way to this side. We have a couple of visuals later, we're going to denote that. And then, of course, from that circumference, using the formula we have earlier, we can do 2 pi r, we can get algebra, we can use that to derive the radius. And that is, in fact, what everyone has done, right? No one has measured a radius ever. No one's ever measured the radius of Earth. They've only ever calculated it off a circumference measurement. And how they say they measure the circumference of the Earth, ladies and gentlemen, is always to take shadows of the sun. So follow the logic here. We're measuring the sun, looking at the sun, computing Earth. No, wrong. Measuring the sun, looking at the sun, computing the sun. Great. Right. Now, now, now we're sticking with it. So again, works just as well for a plain earth actually works way better for a plain earth because we have other corroborative measurements and optical limits and things that would actually correspond with this super nicely whereas uh sphericity and glo globular sphere would need physical earth curvature tantamount to show up somehow somewhere which you know no one's ever found anywhere ever but it could be nice right so again here's what eratosthenes did here's the data here's the numbers here's the measurement the only thing i want to disagree with is the application, of course. And of course, <laughs> if we have the same dimensions of that they apply to sphericity and the ground beneath our feet, if we simply apply that to the optical spherical limit of our view, we get something like this, which is exactly what we see. We see in a radius around us, optically defined by this radius, which is really computed by the limits of the sun. So we've taken the sky, we've denoted its limits, and we've used those limits to denote the limits of our ground. Oh, wait, no, no, no. The limits of our vision. Right. All right, right. Looking at the sky, sticking to the sky. All right. So this actually is denoting, say, the radius as an equidistant point around you. And up top, we have what's called the corresponding uh, chord. So we have an arc, <laughs> an arc length, and a chord length. This would be a chord. This would be an arc. We have a curve, a curved uh, way to get to that distance, which would be linearly and then up along this curve, right? That would be what that bigger number on the top represents. And this would be just the equidistant part that never changes, 3959, right? And the trig that we do this uh, to do the celestial sphere, we use a unit circle to enforce this as the hypotenuse. This would be the radius. But this is what computes as the actual distance. Here's how the radius works. Here's how the measurement works. And again, just a quick, I think, just a quick GIF. Yep, showing the equivalence between the two. Now, when we try to disprove the radius, right, it's a little bit tough because they never gave us the radius. 
We derived the radius. They gave us circumference. McToon measured circumference in the spreadsheet. They've repeated the measurement of circumference. They've meticulously always corroborated and reiterated circumference measurement. So let's just say that's an accurate measurement, right? That's an accurate measurement. Literally, the 3959 applies to the, the limit of your of review and the circumference that they keep uh, they keep measuring based on the things in the sky would apply to the limit of your spherical vision. That makes way more sense. So then stuff like this, the optical curve formula, right? When we look at it, it was always for determining the rate of optical dissension into the horizon, not the physical rate of curvature beneath your feet. This would then apply to the rate at which things appear to recede into the horizon, or more accurately, the rate at which things appear to disappear through angular resolution limits on a flat plane bottom up through bottom up obstruction. Right, the only way that it could possibly happen. We'll get to that in a little bit. Am I going wicked fast? How are we doing? Solid. Solid. Everyone cool? Edward, how you doing? You listening? Can I quiz you? Yeah, just got here about five ago. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Glad to be here, though. Hope you're... Nice. Good to see you, bro. Obviously fucking with you. <laughs> All right, Edward, yeah. so when you look through your eyes and you see the, the horizon, what are we talking about, globe or what? <laughs> Is that with or without my prescription glasses on? Both. <laughs> one is, I think one is definitely flat, and the other one is more of a blurred, claymation, trippy type version of flat. <laughs> That's acceptable. <laughs> Globular flat and blobular flattening. Yeah. So you described an oblate geoid or whatever? Nice. <laughs> there was a pear in a fruit basket in the window I was looking out of. It may have been a pear shaped thing as well. <laughs> I may have been looking out through a curved lens, but I'm going to ignore that and then measure the curvature of the land. <laughs> Crazy. It's crazy how they literally are like, oh, well, the, the for 2000 years, we've known it's a sphere. And it's like, how? Oh, by aggressively misapplying this measurement. Oh, OK, terrific. That makes me feel much better about it. And again, these two things are identical, like, you know, mathematically, log logistically, logically, visually. I mean, how many other ways can I equate two things? Right. The circumference measurement of the, the limit of this vision over here would be this way, this way, this way, every which way, right? Because that's how circles work. But it would always denote this amount. And in this case, when we're only seeing half of it above it, would denote half of that amount if we're going to do area. But we're only looking at this 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 much of the world, right? Denoted constantly, corroborated by every measurement of the sun at, at equinox, at every shadow we, we take. Every time we optically look at the sky and we denote Okay, I mean, where the tropic should be, what the sun inclination is, what the 23-point foot of the tilt of that is, that's all derived from, from the sky and transported right back to this uh, optical radius that you look through, right? This is what it's all been applied to, and that's why all the math works perfectly when we get later. And again, the only difference between these two is area. Otherwise, hemisphere and sphere would be identical, right? Literally, especially from inside, you can never tell the difference, which is where we are, after all, inside one of these, with people telling us that this is the truth with no corroboration, a bunch of science, a bunch of textbooks funded by Rockefeller and a bunch of pseudoscientific pseudo stuff they chose to teach us when we were children in our brains most malleable. Or uh, we have this logically deduced, coherent, mathematically based uh, comparison, different application of the same measurement, in which case all measurements are corroborated and all things meld cohesively into a nice logical argument. I mean, I may be biased, but one of those makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and again, just to put it in uh, all the all the layers here, right? The, all the measurements we have this circumference being measured based on this optical radius being observed based on this sun casting these again parallel sun rays. We're not we're not going to touch that. We we'll assume we're going to operate within the paradigm of retardation for now. We're going to assume that even though no one's ever seen parallel sun rays, that they are in fact parallel and that we only see them crepuscular as an aspect of perspective, which we can agree with. We're going to assume that in reality, the whatever makes no difference. If we do that and we look at this measurement here, we, we see the same thing applying, right? We have this circumference being corroborated, measured, 
denoted by equinox, denoted by subsequent equinoxes, used for determining longitude, used for determining latitude. Every, every single measurement that we've ever made has been about this sphere right here, right? And they just misapplied it to this goofy artist rendering right here. I mean, you could say that, you know, this is the radius of that globular chunk here, 3959, equidistant in every direction. I mean, you could also say it applies 3 and 3D to this, which would be the circumference, right? Which one of those is, is the circumference? Could someone use the spherical formula for the circumference and denote which one of these it specifically applies to? No, of course not, because there is no spherical circumference. It only is one formula, as we started with. Therefore, the decision to apply it to a sphere, which is, in fact, like a 3D layer of nested circles, you'd have to have, like, corroborative, substantive reasoning Otherwise, you would always just simply apply it to the circle, like everyone who ever has before you, right? You wouldn't need to take that leap into nothingness. But no, we have the circumference here, <laughs> again. Could be this way, could be this way, could be every which way. It's always going to come up the same, right? That circle. And then, of course, the same circle, represented exactly the same way on our flat Earth. So we just taken it out, flattened it out, given our same viewing radius, and behold, it would be from inside indifferentiable it would be absolutely identical just another representation of how the circumference would be comparable and then finally equal right equal these two would be the same if you were inside them how would you tell the two apart anyone <laughs> i mean i can't think of a way it would be you could, tell, you could tell the two apart if you had physical empirical measurements of earth curvature if you if you could actually prove that there was curvature you would, would be able to say hey this one matches our observations but if you measured for curvature and found there was none then i guess that would say that would indicate that the uh, flat earth model would would describe the would describe the observation better very you well. Can, you can also tell that it's not. You can also tell that it's not spinning, not moving at all, and the gravity wouldn't work in the right way for it to hold things the way that they hold. Like you wouldn't even have to go with all those things that are contrary to your observation, right? Oh, you have to go with all that nonsense inversion stuff too. No, no, no. I'm just sticking with the basics. <laughs> no, that's very, very good, dude. Right? It's so. If we had physical Earth curve evidence, <laughs> it's like ah, well, that's good. They never found any of that. And that's the only thing that will separate it when we corroborate it with the limits of optics in, in a little bit. But for now, let's go with our boy Cryptosthenes, who we knew was the actual G of the situation, right? Who did all the measurements and his retarded cousin Eratosthenes came along and wrote it down wrong. But that's all right. History remembers it differently. If we just take a look at, you know, what we're looking at here. So we have the same measurement, the same visualization, but we can apply it to the night sky as well more accurately right if we have say the visual radius and the stars would appear to recede and they respond to the same law of perspective as everything else in the world does tall mountains tall things objects uh, buildings etc which they do as guys a spoiler they respond exactly the same and the same rate and in the same way so that's why law of perspective would govern the sky right and that's why 69 miles per degree as a facet of perspective functions perfectly well on a flat plane when you properly account for the uh, viewing radius and the viewing limit and you don't assume that you see forever like a retard so this is just a nice i think visual background to go through how the nighttime sky would nicely mimic what we're looking at what's what eratosthenes reportedly so far corroborated right now you have the stars uh, you're gonna have people asking you what, what you have the stars going below the horizon that and look, looking like they go underneath us and come back up is that the same way it would work with the flat Earth? Well, so you can model it that way for sure. And that's because the math for hemispherical calculations works identically to spherical calculations as we were starting to go over earlier. And it's a very good point because you can assume all the stars go below you and the sun goes below your feet. Or you can assume it goes across you in the same circle and the same circumference, right? And there's a reason those two things are equivalent, and that's how they built the celestial sphere. They just took the circumference, say, of it going across a flat plane around a circle, and they said, okay, that circle is actually the rate of this giant circle, and when you don't see it, it is beneath your feet, because mathematically, it would work out the same, right? That circle is the same. So if I do, say, math, 
off the bottom hemisphere of my non-existent dome here. Like if I just pretended that there was an actual line here and I did math, say based off uh, let's do a right ascension hour angle difference, say, then that would work perfectly for the things I see up here, even though what is below my feet doesn't actually exist. It's just treating this as a perfect hemisphere that allows the math to treat it as a perfect sphere to function when used correctly. Does that, does that make sense or did I screw it all up? No, yeah, it's the perspective. And that's the, that's the reason they, they pick and choose with the perspective about the stars. They don't want it to be perspective when it just seems like it's going below your, your feet. But they do right. want it to be perspective when it works out to their favor, yeah. But like what? specifically on the math, because the math of the celestial sphere is tricky there, right? That's, that's why it all works. <laughs> that's why it works perfectly. Yeah, I was going to say specifically regarding the math, showing that it's not mutually exclusive there is the is pivotal, really, right? Because it's presented as a one-sided argument for the spherical side. But as Shane's showing, you don't, you know, you don't need to apply it to a sphere. You only do that for funsies. Right, but the math like would work. Like the way that the celestial sphere works is they assume this is a real sphere, right? They mm -hmm. assume the bottom half is the equidistant part when you can't see it, and it's all the way out here around. From your, it's doing a circle over here, and they're telling you actually, no, 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 it's this circle. And you're like, oh, what's the difference mathematically between those two? No, nothing. Okay, those two circles are identical. This circle that it's is apparently traveling with a high, like a a supposed bottom, and the mathematically derived say bottom uh, bottom hemisphere and the math of, of spherical trig, right? Or it goes around the circle, around flat Earth like this, and it's the same circle, same circumference, except when you don't see it, it's over here, and when you don't see it, it's over here. The amount of time you don't see it in each instance is exactly the same, and that's how they got the celestial sphere to work, because if you assume that the sky is a celestial sphere, and then you do, you know, like I said, trig off the bottom half of that, assuming that it'll be, say, over here when you're not seeing it, and you do a right angle, right? And you, get some, and you do some trig, it will absolutely show up there because the circumference value they started with is exactly the same, and they're not actually computing the sphere that you're living on. They're just computing the sphere of the limit of your vision. I hope, I hope that makes sense. That's crucial. Yeah, that is a crucial thing, and that's the thing, because most people think, oh, well, here we go. It's going below my feet. You can see right there that that's, that's the stars going below us. We must be on a ball, and that's yeah. where they got us. Dude, like, so when Professor, not Professor of anything yesterday, started his opening with, we've known for thousands of years that the Earth is a globe because of everything in the sky. I was almost like, whoa, it is that. And then he's like, for thousands of years. And again, he's quoting this, this specific measurement, right, which doesn't prove for us to be at all. This is how everyone has known for thousands of years. So not Professor's big proof in the Witsit debate was a misunderstanding of this. How sad. The professor doesn't understand basic trig formulas with circumference. Oof. Isn't that what he always does to people? Let's not see his luck. Let's just not talk about him. Who gives a shit? And again, just some more, some more visualization for how this is equal. This is, you know, the one dude in the middle living. <laughs> He's over here. You can see him measuring the angle to the sun, computing the limit of this vision, right? And then it's like, oh, well, you don't know that you've just been computing this vision and that the Earth goes on this far. You, you'd be able to tell. You wouldn't be able to tell at all. At all. A couple more, I think, just to nail it home. Equally, right? Circumference is not exclusive. And moreover, it more applies to a circle. You'd have to stretch it to apply to a sphere because it's just nested layered circles. And again, same thing here. Look, it's the Earth. It's the globe. I proved it. And, oh, wait, 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 wait. We have to go back. Yeah, no, not, right? Just a flat plane that the dude is standing on. No, it's definitely the Earth. Oh, look, listen. <laughs> they are identical. So, what this, you have a question? No, I was going to say, this is the thing they really didn't want anyone to figure out if they wanted to keep the ball. Yeah. Yep, 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 because here's how we get into it, right? <laughs> the substantiation, so to speak, the limits of our view. We have on the left just a basic logarithmic hyperbolic exponential graph. We have in the middle from our favorite paper, our hyperbolic, we, we, know, we see in 3D spherical uh, geometry, and they denoted that this, based on how we see with the distortion from straight linear, would denote when we have, say, negatively curved or positively curved distortion, and they denoted it, say, at far range and hyperbolic, and then far zone, and near range, uh, uh, elliptic in the near range and hyperbolic in the near far zone, right? So that was their conclusion for the specific geometry that they would apply. 
I would disagree, right? With further examination, we did some math for the stars and we determined actually it has this logarithmic like approaching limit but never reaching it function that more closely mirrors reality. So if we say uh, I don't know, hyperbolic at uh, well, a far range, logarithmic at extreme and exponential linear for most of it, that would probably be more accurate. So that is based on a study on how we see, right? And they had to denote based on where, where we see distortion, what type of geometry best describes it. It's not Euclidean, it's not orthographic 3D perfect space that doesn't properly describe how we see. Now, the other part would be the equation, right? The equation where we denote, or we can get the radius of Earth always when we have the distance to the horizon and the angular resolution limit. And that's just a function of your small distance angle and basic trig functions to get angular resolution and distance. And we're going to go into that a little bit here, maybe, may, maybe a lot, uh, maybe a lot. And we're going to, because we're going to go into that with uh, the debate later on a whole bunch too. So again, remember how we started with this guy. And then um, I see it didn't work, but I was supposed to overlay this circle as an arc onto that circle because this is what we're computing. When we're using the arc function, like when I say, <laughs> say, uh, when, you know, how we're getting the limit of our spherical view, what, what we're getting is an arc length and we're using an arc length because of the nature of the spherical limit, right? This is the, the limit of our vision. That's how we get to use the arc and function. That's how it applies as an arc length. And what we're actually getting is the lower extremity limit of our vision. And it kind of works better with visual, but let's imagine it here, right? This is from our favorite paper where they picked some values, literally, you know, the red wavelengths of light for least refraction, the diameter of the human eye, this average height of a person, literally chose all the circumstances most akin to every average uh, circumstance to be most fair, to get the most realistic sort of equation. Of course, the distance to the horizon formula gives us that, you know, for a six foot observer with this amount of curvature for on a ball or seeing in the limit of radius 3959, gives us the horizon at 2.9999957 miles, right? Or th roughly three miles, right? And then they use this calculation to denote the radius. They use the limit of optics right here, Rayleigh's really, really criteria to get angular resolution limit. And that's at 0 0.021 degrees once you convert to radians and compute Rayleigh's actual factorials, right? And then you get this <laughs> times two. We can explain that times two in just a minute. Theta times two equals this amount, which would, when computing back out, including the distance to the horizon, give us 3958.807867.4, right? That's the closest resolution to a radius for the supposed Earth that I think you can derive. And again, it's using angular resolution limit for the radius criterion based on the human eye, human height of six feet, red wavelengths, and the human aperture diameter. So that's weird that that would exist. And that's Shane, really, really quick, um, with the uh, human eye angular resolution limit, uh, where where is that number derived from? So it's derived from basic trig, right? When we do angular resolution, stuff like this. When we look uh -huh. at Rayleigh's criterion, we can go into that a bunch. It's essentially Rayleigh's criterion, right? So it's, it's determining. And then using the human eye as an aperture, we say use a bug, and then we can determine if the bug is this, this sized, here's how far we have to be to see it. Here's how far it'll be before we don't see it. That's what it's based on. Got you, thank you, man. So yeah, we can go into this, the variables that we pick. This was a, a while back, but again, this is just uh, Rayleigh's criterion being represented. It is a ratio, right? Theta would be Rayleigh's, and it's the, the wavelengths represented by the top and the diameter of the aperture should be the bottom D, right? Super easy. And it's just a basic uh, pictogram for the wavelength description. Again, we chose something like 600 and something to get the closest to the radius. It's right about red, which also is the least receptible to refraction at, a, uh, at the surface, right? Which is, of course, where all refraction takes place. Also, this whole thing is not like for a constant time it's for a an instant in time right in a blink of an eye we've calculated what the distance is and should conditions change or at atmospheric refraction kick up or it get hotter and you know atmospheric lens a little bit all all of it would change it would change in an instant 
it is covariant in that it changes and scales together to give you the same result, but it, it would change, right? That's what we're deriving. When you're doing anything about a realistic situation physics-wise, and you're dealing with time, you're always dealing with an instant in time. Super important to note also because, you know, uh, time isn't really a metric for anything. Isn't There's no future or past. There's only ever now. So we can just use that in math, and that works out well. When I said earlier about this part, when we got the math, and it says 2, two times the angular resolution here's how that comes into play right we say that it's, it's looking at this person over here but he's assuming that look based on the rate of either optical or physical curvature i can see this far but i need a measurement of double this distance so what i do is i see this far i take the measurement for half the distance that i double it assuming the same rate and it absolutely works it's just a way to devise it right it's just People have questioned this so hard, like, no, I've debunked the whole thing. That's not the rate of curvature. And it's like, oh, so you disagree with eight inches per mile squared because that, that's all this is coming from, right? <laughs> that, that, that's all we're denoting here is the parabolic rate of prescribed drop based on either a physical ball with radius 3959 or a flat plane with doing radius 3959. Again, they would be identical. Right, so radius criterion, right? We can just quickly cover this because it is crucial. And it's like the radius of an airy disk as they have over here. It's something that they derive from that R over here and they link equal to the length, equal to the length of light after the aperture and it diffracts it before and after it hits the detector. So it's this math times the theta of that angle where L is again, the length, right? And then the aperture as depicted over here, but there's diffraction essentially past this point. So it means diffraction in this case is unresolvability, essentially, and it's using light. So if the aperture diminishes, there's more diffraction, then the area disk enlarges, and then the length uh, has that relationship with it, right? So if you reduce the size, the area disk gets smaller, right? Then if it gets bigger, then you create more of a pinpoint. So the larger the aperture, the smaller the area disk, the smaller the aperture, larger area disk. All right. More diffraction, larger the aperture, less diffraction. So this is specifically Young's double slit experiments too, which is where radius criterion is derived. And it just looks at these apertures, these angles of incidence over here, which always applies to light. And it just, you know, not going to go into the, to, to the specifics, they derive that the, you know, theta in radians is equal to 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the diameter of the aperture. That's what this is backing up. And that's what radius criterion is. It is a ratio. Right, and it's based on the limit of optics. So how far can you see? It applies not only to an eye, but to a telescope, to an optic lens, to a satellite, to anything, anything that has optics, right? An aperture, diameter, and focal point. That, that's, if Toby was here, he would tell you all about it. <laughs> so we have this angle, let's say over here, theta, right? Represents the radius of an area disk. And it also represents the distance at which two area disks would overlap. So not only does it tell you the limit at which you can resolve things, it tells you the rate at which two things become unresolvable as one. So once they overlap by more than half, then you can't be resolved at all. The two objects become one, one is missing. Right? So if the disks were small, they'd overlap quickly. And if they were bigger, they would overlap slower. Right? So the smaller theta, the smaller the angular resolution, the better the resolution. So the larger wavelengths and smaller apertures diffract more are less resolved versus the larger apertures and smaller wavelengths that diffract less and are more resolved. So this is just going over that principle and how it gets scaled dynamically to maximum and minimum on either side. And then a little bit more application before we bring it back home for how we're going to apply it for our Eratosthenes measurements, of course. So this is, again, the lens diagram, assuming that a human eye is a lens and it has angles for light that we're going to intersect at and be able to see. And then it computes the math based on this. But it says, you know, if we return here, the object gets further and shorter. The two rays through F1 prime and F get closer and the information overlaps. All right. So. It does say that the light source will send out any number of wavelengths along the visible spectrum, and it's just for uh, modeling, essentially. And it says below is the diffraction pattern of white light with a red laser and a diffraction overlay. So it's showing this right here. But if we just go over the overlapping here, it says, so like more divergence, you get to the unresolved 50% point a little bit over here. 
And then at 50%, any aspect will be lost, and that's pretty much over here. And if the convergent rays below the line overlap, then two rays become one, and that's sort of over here. And then as we skip to earlier for our question, here's like the real life application of how we use right, these criterion to determine angular resolution for human eyes and then apply it to real life, say, sight lines and practicality, right? So we just say, well, we know, say, the size of that bug. We use basic trig to do, you know, let's just sine, cosine, right? <laughs> We're using the basic, uh, basic trig to do distance, distance formula. We have examples we can bring up with spreadsheets that would just say input angle in radians, input the size of an object, we we'll compute the distance. Or input, say, the distance and the angle, and it will input the size. It's all one, you know, wonderful, happy relationship exercising the exact same formula, right? So if we notice, if we algebra a little bit, we can move that around and we can say, hey, right here is what we're dealing with. Tangent theta equals height over D. Wait a second, isn't that the same as this? Well, yeah, I mean, we didn't make it up. This was handed to us, right? It was handed down <laughs> generously. So if we look at, oh, wait, one more. Yeah, so we have our angle theta, right? We apply it to any distance. We calculate the smallest diameter height that we can resolve. And then we do a practical example. Let's say this bug is 20 feet away. 1.22 times the wavelength over the diameter equals this theta. And convert that to radians would equal this angle to get this distance for this height bug. So it's, if it's two millimeters and our wavelength of light is 550 nanometers, say so our people's four millimeters, then we know based on this math that our bug is 20 feet or 6.1 meters away because this beautiful, super cool, super easy, super practical, the basis of everything. So, and this is gonna also govern bottom up obstruction. Say ramping up as angles, uh, we have a bunch more to go through, but just to reiterate, right? An object never disappears until two theta is met essentially until both of these angles are met. If you can see above and below the eye line, it's still resolvable either way. And if both become unresolvable, then it's still visible. Makes sense, right? Let's see if uh, loss of information only occurs within that angle and at our wavelength and at the pupil diameter. So the horizon represents all information above or below, which is right here. Put another way, a horizon is comprised of either plus or minus 0 0.02 degrees on either side of your eye line. That's essentially, of all this as a circle, what we're seeing and what we're resolving. And again, we get back to the six foot observer stuff when we get bottom up obstruction over here, right? So in the case of say, and let's see, so if the floor is compressing an object more than the ceiling because we're much closer to the floor as a limit than the ceiling. And the ceiling in the case of a sky is incredibly much, much higher. So. The case of also two theta being met simultaneously is very rare because you'll need the floor and the ceiling to be the exact same height from your eye. In order for that to occur, you'd have to be slightly above, uh, right, closer to the floor than you are the ceiling. That's never how you perceive anything. If you're closer to the ceiling than you are the floor, then theta is going to be met along the ceiling a lot quicker, and the object will disappear top up, right? That's never been seen because no one's ever been in the position to see the sky box of the sky closer than the ground. That's why it's always bottom-up obstruction. That's why it necessitates bottom-up on a flat plane. So you need, it exists, uh, let's see, so you need four. Four rays necessary, an object that exists above and below the eye line, right? So you need both of these to exist. Top remains, bottom loss. But it does disappear bottom-up because this is closer to the bottom line than the top, essentially. We're going to go into bottom-up obstruction a little bit more, but here's essentially how we're applying it, right? We took this measurement where this dude over here, we see the sun does this arc. We denoted it over here at this shadow length. Our buddy denoted it over here at this shadow length. We've computed the circumference of this circle. And now, based on that measurement, we can compute the radius of our circle, the distance to our horizon visibly from our observer height within this circle, and the angular resolution limit of our position within the circle. That's the rate at which things become unresolvable. All based on this observation, optically, of the limit of our view. Beautiful. And again, just a quick thing on the drop rate. People like to apply it linearly. It is not linear, it's parabolic, of course. 
it scales. That's why they say up to a thousand uh, meters or something like that. But it's a, it's more accurate to do it like this. You know, at each mile, this is the feet drop like, for our parabolic rate of drop, right? You know, for eight miles, it's eight squared all 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 the way through. You have to convert it to feet. You got you know point six six seven times whatever your parabolic increment is. So for eight miles, eight squared. Nine miles, nine squared, etc. Point six six seven times nine miles would give us the op the actual prescribed drop rate and of course in this case the optical drop rate never been physical how we got to physical drop and physical curvature all, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure but it's it's been misapplied guys we want optic optic curvature optic drop rate optic eight inches per mile squared and real quick here is how we sort of denoted all of this right it's not like we made it all up worked it out in a spreadsheet put it all together added it all up right here if you want to screenshot it is actually all the formulas you would need to straight copy and paste and do it for yourself right no <laughs> behind the curtains no magic no nothing if this is put together by our good buddy amish right who just put the formulas in a good working order for anyone to be able to replicate because he's interested in the truth right? he wants people to see this is the truth right here we have our wavelength the coefficient it's all labeled uh, you know, I can put a spreadsheet in the chat if you guys want. Everyone can share it. We can all use this together. Poke out any holes you think may be there. Just kidding. Uh, if I already did that, there are none. Anyway, here's the completed version without the formulas with the actual values all twitted up, right? We have the distance to the horizon calculated based on our wavelength of our coefficient for Rayleigh's criterion and our limits of optics down denoted by converted to radians. Converted to degrees, base and height, converted back to feet, back to meters, getting our distance to the horizon both in miles and in meters to compute our radius, derived radius of vision. Boom, right there, right? Always working, always helping, derived angle right there, limit of human eye, 0 0.02 degrees, right? So we're matching it up all the way. And just for our uh, naysayer group, Globies, who were like, the radius criterion doesn't work because I can choose a different wavelength and it breaks. And it's like, wrong. I can choose all these wavelengths and all these diameters. And just like we built a universe with covariantly scaling factors, we can covariantly scale the limit of optics right through the radius criterion, you know, uh, wavelength and diameter variable requirements. Just so everyone's clear, right? This is also in the spreadsheet I'll disseminate and share with everyone. Super easy not just one cherry picked wavelength pair it's <laughs> if you notice these all equal 0.02 degrees this is all angular resolution and of course just because we have a formula it, it, if you denote if you negate one side of it, it it doesn't matter we can give that to you we can still derive the other side right if you negate tangent of theta, of theta and we still have the distance to the horizon and the radius we can compute tangent of theta by this formula so doesn't stop anyone Matter of fact, exercise in futility. Any questions real quick before we go into the last part here? A uh, real quick question, Shane. With regards to like, um, say surveyors, for example, I'm fairly certain that they do not take into account curved visual space in their calculations. Would you say that that's an issue for them? Or would you say that they could somewhat accurately substitute their claim physical curvature to make the values work out? That's a good question. I mean, geodesic surveyors, first of all, taking measurements that are stacked from planar measurements and then applying them geodesically to a predefined ellipsoidal model, commonly WGS84, or Clark Gibson, or something like that. So when they're taking right, the actual... Right, with the lat lines and all that. But I'm just <laughs> right? saying, like, with regards to specific observations, um, like, they don't take into account curved visual space. So I'm just asking, like, can, do you see that being, like, a like a major issue for them? Or would you say that they could just say, well, even if I do agree that the curved visual space is legit, it curves at the exact same weight rate that we claim that earth physical earth curvature is curving. So we wouldn't take into account anyways. You kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to differentiate the thing that you're standing on from the bottom of your eyeball when you only ever see the thing that you're standing on through the bottom of your eyeball, right? Certainly. Um, I think, moreover, it's important to point out, right, that for geodesic surveying to work, they actually 
are already applying all sorts of things. They don't know where down is. They're assuming from a geoid that has a echo potential relationship perpendicular to the relationship of gravity has to be necessitated definitionally. And then of course they're assuming down is just an you know, ultimate infinite tangents to a sphere with a centripetal inward force. Downward acceleration is just determined by centripetal inward acceleration downward. So that's why down can't be represented down universally for everyone has to be infinite tangents to a sphere along the outside. This definitely needs a different visual, but uh, <laughs> I'll assume everyone gets how level doesn't exist on a sphere. That's why they have to say level is a uh, curve because infinite tangent lines ends up in golf ball earth and that's retarded. So what they have is, you know, uh, level is curved and it just follows the curve. When you say level, it actually follows the curve that you can't see. So is that optic curve easily replaced with physical curve? Absolutely. One for one happens all the time. Okay, awesome. One for Thanks, one, man. and if they tried to account for it, it would nullify their measurement of curvature, right? Because they couldn't distinguish between curved visual space and and uh. Well, that's what that's kind of what my question curvature. was aimed at. Because yeah. if you're if you have two explanations for an observation and both of them kind of explain it accurately, accurately, then like obviously claiming that the fact that one of them explains it accurately all of a sudden now proves your point of view, that would be just textbook reification, you know, uh, begging the question. So like really the question that I was kind of uh, asking was, is this, is this any in any way exclusive to flat earth in terms of curved visual space and the fact that geodetic surveyors don't use it? Is that an issue? But it, it kind of sounds like they, they explain it like Jane said, one-to-one -one for physical curvature. So that's not, basically you would have to go to other, um, you would have to look at other factors in order to determine if both models explain it, which one would explain it more accurately. Well, so yeah, they're, they're, they're doing physical curve. We're doing optical curve. The backup yeah. we have for optical curve is all of this math I just showed you. <laughs> Rayleigh's criteria on angular resolution limits, the wavelength of light, the aperture of the human eye, the diameter of a pupil, like all of the real life backup that would corroborate this being an optic based effect. Yeah. Now for the other side, like, they have evidence, I guess. I've never seen it. I don't know what it is. I'll have to ask Ruhiv <laughs> later on. <laughs> and if they did, if they did admit, like if you were to, like if they did admit, okay, the curved visual space is an actual thing, basically they would be stuck saying it's just a coincidence that the ab, that, like it perfectly matches the radius of Earth, right? Because I mean, if, if, the cur if the curved visual space matches the, the claimed, you know, if, if it matches what they're claiming is physical, space and they match one to one then they would be stuck saying oh it's just a coincidence right bro that would be like a coincidence to the eighth decimal place. <laughs> <That would be laughs> eight decimal place coincidence no yeah. yeah it'd be like the coincidence of a celestial body being four times four four hundred times smaller than another one but them appearing the same size in the sky and then you have uh you know them eclipsing each other every 18 years on repeating cycles it'd be that kind of coincidence right 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 exactly that's like a coincidence well said man <laughs> Exactly that. All right. Any other questions? Because the next part's a little bit dense. If that was it. <laughs> okay, cool. So it's just the good old bottom up obstruction. Our friend should be imbibed, should be argued for, should be merrily taken on, argued, you know, this is now going to be ours. All right. So does Earth curve exist? Hell no. Do things appear to disappear from the bottom up? Sure do. Sure do, right? So. Uh, there's a wonderful series that I've been stealing from the whole time called Angular Resolution in Our World. I posted it earlier today on all my channels. I've posted it a bunch of times. I put it on the YouTube. It's in my database. It's referenced all over the place. It's like the the Bible for this. Uh, Life is short, I think, did this, and he put it all together excellently. So this is just a quick, a quick sort of summary of why things disappear bottom up. We'll go into that a little bit more, but these are the best visuals you will ever find on the subject. And of course, the ring of truth to the explanation that goes along with it, substantiated by math and the limit of optics in our good old Rayleigh's criterion, as we see over here. And of course, <laughs> since we started with sun measurements, wouldn't be right unless we applied what we learned and calculated to the sun at the end to denote why, guess what? Sunsets are totally possible. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure that out. So <laughs> I'm just going to read through here. This is a, a, a just a, a basic demonstration disappearing bottom up, right? Compressed angles below the eye line have proportionately expanded angles paired above. So as one compresses, the other expands. That's just the relationship, right? Ha has to be that way. As you move left, the compressed angle to the right, right? And it expands on the right and so forth. 
So for an exceedingly tall object, objects below the eye line are essentially negligible to their total height. So they stratify along the horizon line. So if you're looking at, say, a mountain, right, super tall, way higher than six feet, you can essentially view it as being all above the eye line along the horizon line. So all objects, right? They descend at a rate commensurate with the pairing below the eye line. If you compress the lower angles here, the eye line or that or orthogonal line is going to become more shallow. But at the same time, the orthogonal line is paired above will descend at a higher rate. So if you close to the ground, the descent rate is steep. If higher up, it's more shallow. And that's this rate compared to this rate because of our proximity to this limit versus this limit. Okay, so we're going to super, super basic. We're just going to fly, fly right through, right? So it says here, so on the orthogonal view here, right, these mountains represent the same height if we observe them that way on, on the side, on the orthographic representation. But they are below, you know, in one point perspective. So therefore, they diminish in size according to the transversal lines, right? We could replace it with a 4,000-foot mountain and a 4-foot car parked at different distances. It would be the same phenomenon. So it would be the same height. We would just be lower to the ground relative to the car to view it that way. And then the horizon, we put it lower on the edge of the wheel, and it would be the exact same thing. So we can reverse some of these near-far objects, right, to get them these transverse lines is what we're talking about. And we start to see typical panorama, which would be an aspect of perspective when equally spread out 360. And then we would get, say, six equally sized mountains. So we see the three on the left here are in actually a straight line, but they're converging to the right because of perspective. This is an aspect and a facet of perspective. Because these are straight, but we're viewing it from this angle, our viewing perspective over here in the way that our uh, Vision radius is giving us this 0.2 degrees of our whole circle here. We can only see it as this. This is how we perceive it. And it gets backed up over here. This is the math behind bottom up obstruction, right? Quantified. Quantified for stone, of course. <laughs> Quantification. No, so we're looking at it. We're saying that if this is true, right? And this is sort of the, the premise of the whole argument is that if things disappear bottom up, is it due to optics or physical earth curve? Those are the only two perspective answers. And, of course, we're saying it's due to optics. And here's all the reasons why. Here's all the corroboration why. Here's all the different images that also seem to comport with why. Here's the math that agrees with why. Here's how you can describe this math agreeing with this math why, right? And, again, this is just bottom-up obstruction. The amount by which we lower our observer height is directly proportional to the amount by which we bring the lower horizon closer, right? If the lower horizon is closer with lowered height, once that distance is met, the descending information above our eye line, they will set into the eye line with further distance. So that's a proportional relationship. Hence why we have this. Right? It's illustrating proportion, not actual distances. But uh, let's see here. So yeah, information above or below on either side is paired as an angle opens and the other compresses. So again, these two would have to equate as one increases, the other decreases. One goes left, the other goes right. That's just an equal, an equal and balanced relationship. So the rate of the blue line decreases below our eye line and becomes more stabilized. And the descent rate above our eye line by the corresponding amount, and that appears at this rate, right? So talking about this line versus this line. Um, and just to quantify it, right, we have the rate, uh, the, the amount by which the lower observer height is directly proportional, like I said before, to the amount by which we bring the lower horizon closer. So once that distance is met, so if we take the height and lower it by a certain amount from H down to H2, then the horizon distance will be come in by a directly proportional amount. And that's just showing over here. Directly proportional. So we're saying how much would the bottom of obstruction increase depending on your height and you know, distance from bottom limit to top, well, exactly this amount, an inversely proportional amount. That's why we have one over. So it's just conceptual, but it is a good illustration. And again, what we're dealing with here for optics is this is our angular resolution limit, 0 0.0216 in degrees. We figured that out earlier. If we're looking out and we're looking on a flat and we see, you know, this converge right here, we may assume this is the limit, right? <laughs> And again, this is the continuation on this side. We're just assuming that it goes over to this, this far, right? We only see this far, but we're taking the measurement for six feet. We only see three feet. We just apply the same rate over six feet. That's what was back there in that formula. Here's a pretty good sort of overall demonstration of visual optic drop rate, right? We have that 0 0.066, which is the conversion to feet. 
the demonstration of it being parabolic and not linear, which means, you know, at each point it's increasing at this rate. And then a couple of visuals for how it would apply, how it doesn't apply, how we're using it. And essentially just to travel on all, uh, just to refute all the trolls who are going to say it doesn't work because of this. And it's not right here. Right here is where they need to focus and right here. Conversion to drive. There's a PhD guy who had a lot of trouble converting feet to inches and back and forth with this part of the formula. So I think we're pretty, pretty much done. Wanted to keep it to about an hour. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. So wrapping it up, right? This was the good old depiction of Eratosthenes. And this was our previous uh, answer that it was equally, you know, useful. It doesn't prove anything. But I think it's more apt to now scoop this up as exclusive, backed by all the math radius criterion, angular resolution limits and say, well, no, this doesn't prove first city. As a matter of fact, if you could take this measurement and show me how it applies to the ground beneath your feet, I would be greatly obliged. And in fact, what it does apply is to the limits at which we see the sun, backed up by the rays creating the shadows of which you are measuring in the first place. So instead of being uh, in both buckets now, Eratosthenes will solely be for flat planar Earth with an optical, a spherical 360 viewing limit. Right, and then here's representation of our definitely parallel light rays coming in and our measurement being taken over here and our deduction being, of course, this. One more time, the math we started with, now backed by our understanding of angular resolution, radius criterion, how optics work, how we don't see forever with light attenuation and how everything comports to this circle of vision, how we've measured repeatedly the limits of our vision, how the sun shows us with its shadow links on equinox and how lines of longitude and latitude all agree with this re corroborated measurement of circumference, right? And this is not wrong. This is just aggressively misapplied. And if, oh boy. I gotta turn that down. Uh, got it. <laughs> right? That's joking on dividing by 360. He's like, oh, I took a measurement and divided it by 360. Yeah, that doesn't prove anything. <laughs> Again, all three circumference are the same. Right, so there we go. That'll do Eratosthenes. What do you guys think? Touchdown. <laughs> Formulas for the rate at which things disappear bottom up. Hells yeah. What's up, guys? I'm going to need a summary of everything I just said pronto. What was your presentation don't about? Don't, don't ask questions. Just go. You can sum it up by saying don't go full retard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was taking back okay. Eratosthenes, Piezo. So this are is you, now ours. Are you, are you talking about how you can see further the greater the angle of convergence is to a, to a flat point in the middle? Sort of. I was mostly talking about how if you measure shadow angles from the sun on equinox, then you can also equally measure how far the sun traverses on your flat plane and never measure the rate at which the ground beneath your feet curves. Oh. Right, Crypt Cryptosthenes knew what's up. Word. I talked to my I talked to my math my PhD math professor today about uh, vortices and, and uh, JJ Thompson's uh, vortex model of the atom and stuff. She was telling me her husband works in um, knot theory, like strings and knots. Oh yeah, knot theory, not like not a theory, but like the theory of knots. Like K and, o, K and O T, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go get a drink and get ready for the next thing. If anyone wanna wrap up Eratosthenes questions, anyone?
Oh, are you still? Yeah, you should finish out your. Yeah, this is this is the end of the presentation. You should try to do a wrap up. I thought I did, but I can certainly do another one. Let's roll. <laughs> right. So we started with observations of changing shadow lengths at different places on Earth. Actually, yeah, let's go into this map right here. Uh, where do I have it? Boom. Hey. Okay. Looks like somebody still needs a little bit of help with circular cropping. <laughs> Some, all right, it auto crops and sometimes it sucks. <laughs> but where did I put that perfect cutout that I made with you the other day? Come on. All right. The Gleason special? Yeah. <laughs> I was supposed specifically map out Alexandria. Okay. Let's see. There it is. So I'll put that in Discord at least. Where we live chat. There we go. And then I can just. Change windows to this, and then also there we go. So everyone sees that on repeat. Then I think, right? No. Well, no, they don't. Okay. All right, so they're seeing that. So right there is a nice Gleason's map, which of course is a azimuthal direction preserving projection of the celestial slash geographic graticule and represented in spherical coordinates on the a flat plane. All right, so we have a stereographic projection inverted to represent what we have as the our, you know non-conforming, non-concentric circle, uh, smaller getting reality, right? So we have that, th this mark over here is right at Alexandria, would be right near Greece-ish. And then say if we have the sun coming, circling around flat Earth, this would be the limit at which someone right here would see the sun. That's all it is. That's all Eratosthenes measured. Here's a perfect mapped out version of it. I think I even went a little bit further. Yeah. Because there's another video of just the sun w wiggling out like this. Yeah, and that just shows the sun's eccentric circle paths between annuals, right? So annually, it only goes from one minimum to the maximum, right? That's why we have the concentric circles, right? That's, that's just going to limit where the circle would be at any point in the year. So one whole circle illustrates annual one where the sun, where that circle is each point in that year. And if you see, in this video, if it happens to stop right about here, all right, you, you can see that our boy Eratosthenes over at Alexandria has perfectly measured the circumference to which he can see the sun on our flat plane. So that's the whole, the whole basis of the presentation. That's kind of irrefutable, I think. I don't know how that could be refuted or how you'd have to say, okay, knowing that, uh, I'm going to apply it to the ground beneath my feet instead. You're like, cool. Like, what do you have to back that up? Go. Like, oh, nothing. Yeah, then no. No, that's retarded. We're not going to allow that anymore. It has to go with, you know, uh, applying it to the circle, just like it was intended. What do you think, Dave? Anything else to add? That's fantastic. Everything was great. This is epic. I'm going to share the hell out of this like I do everything else you make. Hell yeah, bro. Thanks, man. Yeah, really, really good stuff, Shane. Thank you. This is this is definitely going on the pacement soon as I uh, soon as I get it updated. Your 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 original Aristophanes sun angles 
where you went over like the pea brain video and stuff like that. That's still to date my most shared video with anybody who brings up sun angles. So this will be a nice little uh, um, follow up to that. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably share that one with like truthers, right? Because it involves the true nature of the sun and the actual toroidal path it makes if you emulate it from every river simultaneously. That's a bit much to the people thinking beneath my feet, earth curve, cuz, right? This one would probably be better suited to them because they're like, oh, all the math that I lean on and refer to vaguely. It's like, no, 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 no. Get, get some specificity in there and look, look what it turns into, I think. And the other one is definitely for truthers who want to know, you know, why the sun can't be triangulated and why the angles are an issue and why it all works. Yeah, for sure, man. 100%. Nice job, dude. Hell yeah. We still got half an hour, 40 oh, yeah. minutes till the debate. Yeah, absolute globe killer because it shows the equivalence so perfectly. Wait, right? you're doing a debate at the same time as the Hildegard presentation? Hildegard got moved to next week. Oh. Yep, and I stepped up to do this instead. Oh. Yeah, I had it ready for a long time, so I haven't been you're able going to, to, to you're going to You're going to engage with Ruhif about perspective? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Ruhu's favorite toy away from him and ferociously beat him with it in public with a oh, smile man. on my face for fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'll be fun. That'll be fun for all of us. <laughs> you going to scream and cry. I mean, I don't know. He might be genial about it. Hey, Shane, one quick tip on VLC. In the settings, you will find there is a switch you can turn off so that it does not re-announce the file name when you have it on loop. Oh, that does annoy you, huh? I don't know. Just looking more pro and people not knowing what you're using to make your tricks happen. Oh, that's a good point. I never even, I was like, yeah, I just thought that that was a, a thing I had to accept forever. You know? Let me see. See? No, you don't. <laughs> is is Alan here? Where's Toby? I don't know. Tune in at 11 and we'll be answering these questions and more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, Shane. Guess what? My, so my, my, math, my math professor got, right. some, got some brownie points today. Guess what she said? We ended up talking about like quantum field theory and quantum mechanics and like the nature of matter and stuff. Oh. Oops. Must be doggy break time. LOL. Nah, he needs 10 minutes on his own, I'm sure, before uh, 8.30 rolls. All right, boys. Sorry about that. I was AFK for the last couple minutes there at the end. But anyway, I'm going to wrap up here. So join us on Thursday for our weekly Twitter space. We'll be hosting that at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then a Friday will be Mystery Meat Friday. So we'll see what, what happens on Friday. And uh, I think that's about it for the week, boys. I'm going to wrap it up and then join us next Monday for Reading Night again. And then Tuesday, we'll be doing a follow-up presentation with Dr. Bennett. He'll be presenting part two of the Ether Hildegrad model. So definitely be sure to tune in and check that out.